Hello, and welcome to World of Warbirds. I'm Brian Pierce. The term thinking out of the box has become kind of cliche, but the development of the mosquito is a beautiful example of unconventional thinking and defending your ideas even against opposition, and perhaps even more importantly, against long-time disinterest. Captain Sir Geoffrey de Havilland and some partners formed the de Havilland Aircraft Company in 1920. The company built a raft of different types of aircraft, probably having the most success with their Moth series of bi-wing trainers that ended up being basically the ab initio trainer, if not for the world, then for at least the British Commonwealth. There were a whole range of moths. I think we've heard of the Gypsy and Tiger moths, but what about Cirrus moths, Gennet moths, Moth Majors, Giant Moths, Fox Moths, Puss Moths, Swallow Moths, Hawk Moths, Leopard Moths, and Hornet Moths? At this point, we're going to jump ahead a bit to get away from this swarm of moths to look at a more substantial and advanced de Havilland aircraft, the de Havilland DH-91 Albatross. This was designed in 1936 as a mail plane, but could also be configured to carry about 20 passengers. This was a sleek, very clean-looking aircraft. They built only seven examples, but these gave good service until they were all scrapped by 1943 due to lack of spare parts. Why are we even talking about the Albatross then? It was because it was built with a ply, balsa, ply, wooden sandwich construction that might just come in useful later. In 1936, the British Air Ministry published specification P-1336, which was seeking a twin-engine medium bomber that could carry between 3,000 and 8,000 pounds of bombs at 275 miles per hour at up to 3,000 mile range. This was the specification that would lead to the Halifax, Manchester, and Lancaster, all airplanes that look very different than our subject aircraft. But Geoffrey de Havilland thought that he could meet or exceed the requirements of P-1336 by using his recent Albatross design as a jumping off point to save time in designing. Also, he would continue using the wooden materials in the new bomber, figuring that in any future conflict, not having to rely on supplies of scarce metals would give his company a leg up. He planned to create a small bomber with such an aerodynamic smooth body and minimal skin friction that he wouldn't need the weight of so many turrets, guns, ammos, gunners, etc. Speed would be the only defense. Now, he just had to sell the idea to the powers that be. In July 1938, de Havilland wrote a letter to Air Marshal Wilfred Freeman, who was in charge of research and development for the government's Air Council, stressing the benefits of wood over metal in all ways, including availability, lightweight, and strength. In October, another letter was sent, this time suggesting basically the same idea. In late 1938, de Havilland presented his idea for a twin-engine, very clean aircraft with two crew and no defensive armament to the Air Ministry. The Air Ministry demurred and suggested that de Havilland might build wings for, you know, other serious and real bombers. But de Havilland kept at it, paying for the project himself the whole way. In October 1939, the proposal was made again. Twin engines, smooth airframe, speed is defense, two crewmen and four cannon in the nose. The air ministry still didn't see it. They wanted defensive guns and more crewmen. Finally, in November 1939, the ministry accepted the airplane as a fast reconnaissance bomber. A meeting was booked with the RAF to present the idea, and in early December, it was the RAF that now couldn't see the concept. They didn't want bombers with no defensive guns, but they would accept an unarmed photo recon aircraft. The door had been opened a crack. Finally, in March, a contract was signed for 50 reconnaissance bombers of what was now designated the DH-98. In June 1940, the aircraft had been named Mosquito, but due to Dunkirk and evacuation of the BEF, the project was in jeopardy again. Fighters would be needed to defend the nation, more than reconnaissance bombers. De Havilland stated that the plane could be used as a fighter too, and so a prototype for a fighter version was authorized and kept the project on life support. Lord Beaverbrook, the Minister of Aircraft Production, tried to kill the project a couple of times. At one point, the delivery of materials was blocked, and for a time, work on the Mosquito stopped. 
Was it ever going to get built? In July, de Havilland promised that the pesky mosquito project would not affect the company's primary tasks of producing tiger moths and airspeed oxfords, repairing hurricanes, and building Merlin engines. De Havilland also promised 50 mosquitoes by the end of 1941. It looked like the mosquito was going to happen after all. Design and Development Although building airplanes out of wood had become considered passé, it really wasn't a step backwards, but rather a jump forwards, pointing towards what composite material construction would someday become. Using these various wooden elements, plywood, balsa, plywood, in building the fuselage would result in low weight, but also great strength and stiffness. Many other types of timber were used for various parts of the aircraft, depending on the qualities of the types of wood needed. Other woods used were ash, Douglas fir, and walnut. The fuselage was put together in two halves, with all the control mechanisms and cables installed before the halves were put together, in a process known as boxing up. Once the parts were glued together, clamps held everything in place until the adhesive had cured. After that, a skin of cotton fabric was stretched over the parts and covered over with multiple layers of dope and then finally the camouflage paint. The shoulder-mounted wing was also made of wood covered with cotton and dope with metal ailerons, although the flaps were wood and hydraulically powered. The engine nacelles were mostly made of wood, although the engine mounts were made of welded steel tubes. Engine radiators were fitted in the inner wing between the fuselage and the engines. These were split in three sections for oil cooling, main coolant radiator, and cabin heating. The wings contained fuel tanks. The two outer wing tanks each contained 70 U.S. gallons, while the two inner wing fuel tanks each held 172 U.S. gallons. There were also two more tanks in the fuselage. Initially, 545 U.S. gallons was a full fuel load. Engines were two Merlin 21s with two-speed single-stage superchargers turning three-bladed de Havilland Hydromatic constant-speed controllable pitch propellers. Each engine nacelle contained a 15 U.S. gallon oil tank and one engine drove an alternator while the other powered a generator. Electrically driven systems were the radiator shutters, supercharger gear changer, the gun camera, bomb bay doors, and bomb rocket releases. Each engine contained a fire extinguisher. The landing gear was raised and lowered hydraulically and the shock absorbers were a system of rubber discs. Brakes were pneumatically powered and the tail wheel retracted also. The crew of two, which were the pilot and navigator, sat side by side. Initially, the nose was to be transparent like the Bristol Blenheim, but ultimately a solid nose was decided upon. Prototypes In November 1940, the first prototype, E-234, began its engine run and taxi trials and on the 25th of the month took off for the first time, being piloted by the company's test pilot, who just happened to be Jeffrey de Havilland Jr. During the test flights, it was noticed that the landing gear doors wouldn't close all the way and the aircraft had a slight pull to the left, requiring some adjustments. More seriously, another prototype, serial number W4050, exhibited tail buffeting or shaking when the aircraft was in the 240 to 255 mile per hour range. The control column would start to shake and the aircraft would become more and more difficult to keep under control. To discover the problem, small pieces of wool yarn were attached to the surfaces in order to see the airflow, and sure enough, it was discovered that in this speed range, airflow was breaking away from the rear section of the engine nacelles, causing disturbed air to hit the tailplane, causing the buffeting. The fix was to include fillets on the trailing edge of the wings and lengthening the engine nacelles to about 10 inches beyond the trailing edge of the wing. This design changed, smoothed the airflow, and directed it away from the tailplane. It did mean that the flaps had to be divided into inboard and outboard sections. But with the fixes being incorporated, test pilots were reporting that the aircraft was light on the controls and had generally pleasant handling characteristics. When it came to speed, in February 1941, speed trials put the Mosquito at 20 to 30 miles per hour faster than the Spitfire. Prototype W4052 was configured as a day and night fighter and was fitted with a bulletproof windscreen and four 303 British Browning machine guns in the nose. 
Four 20mm Hispano Mark II cannon were located in a compartment under the cockpit floor. The breaches of these cannon extended into the bomb bay. Cartridge ejector chutes were built into the manually operated bay doors. For night fighting, the aircraft was equipped with Mark IV radar equipment and painted black. So with the prototypes proving that the Mosquito was to be one of the fastest operational aircraft in the world and able to do these multiple varied roles, in June 1941, the Air Ministry finally was convinced and ordered 19 photo reconnaissance versions, 176 fighters, and 50 unarmed fast bombers. It was time to start thinking of production, and that's what we are going to look at in the next episode. Lastly, I'd like to do a few shout-outs. The first is a thank you to supporter Bruce Mahoney and super supporter Stan Marcus. Lastly, to call sign Tanner, thank you for your service and stay safe over there. If you appreciate these type of videos, please drop me a super thanks. If you like to listen as well as watch, you can check out the audio podcast on Spotify and all the other podcast apps. And remember, you can purchase Warbird merch at the kit shop. Until next time.